So we're going to restart uh, talking about gas exchange by reviewing uh, the structure of hemoglobin. Remember that hemoglobin from unit one is a quaternary polypeptide structure. It consists of four polypeptide chains, each of which has a heme prosthetic group. Heme, which is a uh, prosthetic group, uh, a not, a poly not a polypeptide. It has a, uh, is inorganic, which means that it has a uh, uh, non-carbon based, uh, a non-carbon based structure. So this is a metal ion here. And this is what binds the oxygen in the blood. So because there are four heme groups, it's going to be able to bind four oxygen molecules. So hemoglobin uh, is able to bind four oxygen molecules. So hemoglobin and four oxygen molecules will get us oxyhemoglobin. Now, in order to investigate hemoglobin and how it behaves, we're going to, we need to extract a sample of hemoglobin uh, and expose it to different concentrations of oxygen, different partial pressures of oxygen. And we'll discuss what partial pressure means in a bit. Um, now, the amount of oxygen that combines with each sample of hemoglobin can be measured. And when you completely fill all of the uh, hemoglobin themes, in all of your hemoglobin in your sample, that will be 100% saturation. If you have 100 hemoglobin molecules and all four of the 100 hemoglobin molecules are have one uh, oxygen molecule on them, that's 400 molecules of oxygen, that's 100% saturation. For every uh, 100 molecules of oxygen you take away, that's 25% saturation gone. So you're taking away saturation by percentages here. So uh, this is your hemoglobin dissociation curve. Your x-axis is a partial pressure of oxygen, and your y-axis is the percentage saturation of hemoglobin. This is a sigmoidal curve. A sigmoidal curve is an S-shaped curve, and this curve indicates that hemoglobin is, uh, is very difficult to remove that first oxygen. It takes a significantly low partial pressure of oxygen to remove the first, hemo the first oxygen. And then the second and third oxygens are easier to remove. There's a sharp decline. And then that last final oxygen is significantly more difficult. So the binding of the first oxygen makes it easier to bind the next, which makes it easier to bind the next, which makes it easier to bind the next. Same likewise, unbinding the first hemoglobin makes it even easier to unbind the next, and even easier to bind the uh, unbind the next. Uh, it's more, uh, sorry, uh, even easier, uh, even more difficult to unbind the next. The more oxygens that are bound to hemoglobin, uh, the higher affinity, uh, sorry, the lower affinity hemoglobin has for oxygen. So. Uh, that could have come across better. Uh, it is easier to take oxygen off of hemoglobin the second or third time than it is the first or fourth time. That's what this S-shaped curve means. Let's just use that last part uh, if you'll just ignore everything I said before. Um, or pick and choose what you want to hear. Uh, now, we're going to talk about the carrying of carbon dioxide now for a moment. Um, around 80 to 85 percent of the carbon dioxide in your bloodstream is carried as hydrogen carbonate, um, uh, bicarb ions, uh, HCO3 minus, um, and about 5 to 10 percent of your carbon dioxide is dissolved in blood plasma just straight up as carbon dioxide. <coughs> wow. Hopefully the editor will cut that out. All right. Um, damn you in your blooper reel. Um, five to ten percent of the carbon dioxide will be dissolved in blood plasma without any kind of dissociation. Um, and uh, about ten or so percent of that carbon dioxide is going to diffuse directly into the carbon into the blood plasma across the plasma membrane and it's going to combine directly with the terminal amino group of the uh, of the hemoglobin 
and create car and uh, bind to form carbamino hemoglobin. And um, that is um, how carbon dioxide is formed. Uh, that's how carbon dioxide is carried in the bloodstream. So once you are in the tissues, this is how that carbon dioxide gets carried. Uh, once you reach the lungs, that is, uh, these reactions are going to be thrown into in reverse. And uh, effectively, everything you're doing is getting this carbon dioxide, which is around 46 or so uh, partial pressure in the tissues, trying to keep that low. And you're trying to uh, dissolve carbon dioxide and trying to dissociate it and change it into other things so that you can get more carbon dioxide out of the tissues into the bloodstream and carry it away and out. But the important takeaway point is that most of that carbon dioxide, the lion's share of it, is going to be taken away and drawn away and excreted as bicarbonate. And the pathway for that is a, is a chemical reaction uh, catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase in both directions, by the way. Uh, so carbon dioxide and water, uh, the reaction between these two is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase, which is this pretty little molecule right here, into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Now, these bicarbonate ions <coughs> Um, are going to be shifted out of the red blood cell in exchange for chloride ions. This is called the chloride shift, and that's really all you need to know for Cambridge purposes. The exact symporter involved, don't worry about that. Um, now, these hydrogen ions are going to bind to hemoglobin, and they're going to denature that enzyme. They're going to form hemoglobinic acid. And hemoglobinic acid, that denatured hemoglobinic acid, that is going to have a lower affinity for oxygen. It's going to induce the release of oxygen from hemoglobin to the tissues. And the release of hemoglobin, uh, the release of oxygen from hemoglobin to the tissues, when there is a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, now that is very convenient. So when carbon dioxide produced in the tissues diffuses across the, uh, in, from the tissues through the capillary walls into the plasma, into the red blood cell, combines with, high, with water, bicarbonic anhydrase into carbonic acid, dissociates into uh, bicarbonate and hydrogen ions, is shifted out, and then this combines with the hemoglobinic acid, releasing oxygen. Then the oxygen is going to diffuse out to the tissues where it is needed the most. That is an advantageous uh, system. All that gets thrown into reverse when the carbon dioxide is in low partial pressures in the alveoli. And the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out into the lungs. And all of this reaction gets thrown into reverse. Into reverse. The hydrogen ions are going to dissociate from hemoglobin <coughs> acid, recombine with bicarbonate and turn back into carbonic acid. Carbonic anhydrase, in reverse, will catalyze back to water and carbon dioxide. And, carbonic, and carbon dioxide will, uh, be higher, will maintain this higher concentration, or partial pressure, rather, and that will continue diffusing into the lungs. Now, this is called the Bohr shift. The Bohr shift is a situation where a high, a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide will uh, cause a decreased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. And that will cause the, um, and that will cause the shift in the hemoglobin in the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve to the uh, right effectively lowering the effectively having the same result as lowering the acidity of the blood a high carbon dioxide concentration a low carbon dioxide dissociation a high carbon dioxide concentration low carbon dioxide concentration will have the same effect as a low acidity a high pH of a left shift of the curve 
temperature effect will have a same, will have a similar effect in that lower temperatures than body temperature will cause a left shift, and higher temperature will cause a right shift. We'll see similar things with increased affinity for oxygen in fetal hemoglobin and myoglobin, similarly moving off. I think we're going to uh, cut the video here. Yeah. Thank you. Cut the video here.